I'm here to share some good news about the future of your brain. We are all neuroscientists. Since the dawn of recorded history, human beings have been trying to comprehend and fix the three-pound lump of pink jelly that resides inside all of our skulls. This is not one of my patients, I assure you. This is a Neolithic brain surgery from five and a half millennia ago, and we can tell the patient actually survived this procedure. We've come a long way since then, but today there are still two billion people on the planet who suffer from neurologic and psychiatric illness. Over two-thirds of us will suffer from some form of brain-related disease in our lifetimes. The human toll behind those numbers is staggering. We need to do more. One of those patients was my inspiration. This is my grandma, Helen. When I was a teenager, she suffered a series of devastating strokes that left her unable to speak or move at the right side of her body. In helping her and my family cope with her devastating disability, I learned just how little we understand about how to safeguard and repair the damaged brain. And so I decided to dedicate my life to helping people like her. I decided to become a neurosurgeon. And for the past six years, I've been training as a neurosurgery resident at one of the world's most innovative programs, Emory University here in Atlanta. I'm very lucky to be there. And it's been an extraordinary journey with a lot of challenges, but a very, very rewarding set of insights. And it's given me access to some of the insights into problems that our patients are having and new technologies on the horizon for treating those problems. The good news, well, we're living at the cusp of a golden age in neuroscience. There's billions of dollars in research funding pouring into the space. New technologies are everywhere. We have tools that are unprecedented in their power, their ease of use, their accessibility, and their cost. If you're a brain geek, this is the best time to be alive in history. Neuroscience research is exploding. The number of publications exponentially increasing year over year over the past three decades. And over the same time period, the same is true for patents, which is a marker of invention. This is a global phenomenon. We've seen the results in medicine. It's now routine to implant deep brain stimulation electrodes in patients like this one here, who's playing his musical instrument while assessing whether his tremor is gone as the air is hitting his cerebral cortex in the operating room. In the world of research, this is from the BrainGate group, this is a paralyzed woman using only her brain signals to control a robot arm and giving herself, for the first time since her injury, a sip of her favorite beverage, a cinnamon latte. Well, I'm more of a pumpkin spice guy myself, but this is <laughs> extraordinary. How about this? Neuroscience is now digital. We're entering the age of big data, and we have tools like the Allen Brain Explorer here. Anyone with a laptop and a Wi-Fi connection anywhere in the world can download this and access more detailed information about the brain and its gene expression, its connectivity, than the greatest scientists had access to a decade ago. This is a paradigm shift, and it's extraordinarily part of it. We're at an age of convergence between neuroscience and technology. In particular, I'm very excited, even beyond the medical sphere, about a range of consumer technologies that are now available for connecting your brain with smartphones and tablet computers. There's a number of products on the market now that purport to help you um, meditate, focus, learn, relax, using your brain waves. Some even stimulate the brain to bring about a change in effect and a mental state. This is the infancy of a renaissance. And it's going to be affecting all of our lives in the near future. The hackers and makers of the world are getting involved. This is much like the early days of the personal computer revolution in the 1970s. Today, we have organizations like this, the Open BCI Project in New York, which, using Kickstarter funding, has produced a three-dimensional, printed, open-source brain-machine interface. You can now do neuroscience at home. Unbelievable. But despite these incredible technologies and this flourishing of activity, you have to take a step back and realize that we have a lot of progress still to make. And progress on some fronts has been slow. This is the father of neurosurgery in the modern day and age. Dr. Harvey Cushing 
photo was taken nearly a century ago, him with one of his uh, post-operative pediatric patients. And I often think of the days of Dr. Cushing, and in, in the century since, really, we're facing some of the same problems. Brain cancer is almost always deadly. For neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, we have no cure, no reliable ability to repair the injured brain. Mental health is still a global burden. And so we have a long way to go, and it's sobering to realize that innovation in neuroscience is nowhere near as rapid as it is in the world of computer technology, where all of our lives have been radically transformed from transportation to communication, shopping to photography. No, no, in neuroscience, taking an innovation from the laboratory into the clinic where it can help patients has taken over a decade in the recent past. And by some estimates, less than 5% of those patents actually are successfully commercialized into products that help people. So I wanted to find out why. My colleagues and I set out to interview neuroscience startup entrepreneurs, people who are working and dedicating their lives to bringing about new technologies in neuroscience. And we said, what are your obstacles? What problems are you facing? And how can we help you get there faster? And to our surprise, access to funding was not the bulk of the problem. You know, capital's important, but it's less than 50%. The majority of the problems they're facing related to things like access to mentorship with deep sector experience, access to partners, access to prototyping facilities, access to a network of peers who were doing the same thing. Many of these entrepreneurs felt isolated. And as I began talking to more of them, I got fascinated by the world of tech entrepreneurship and uh, all the incredible innovations coming out of Silicon Valley and other places like it. And on my nights off from the hospital, I began rolling with a little bit of a different crew. I began hanging out with tech entrepreneurs and startup guys and startup girls. And they taught me some really amazing things. One of the things I learned, there's just something out there called a startup accelerator. I'd never heard of this. None of my colleagues had heard of it. Originating in Silicon Valley about 10 years ago, there's this concept that you can have a rigorous boot camp-like program to enhance the chances of success for early stage companies. This is why Combinator, in the early days, one of the uh, prominent startup accelerators out there, there's over 230 around the world, most of them focus on technology and software, but this model is a proven track record. And as we thought more about it, we looked at what these accelerators provide, mentorship, partners, curriculum, funding, a workspace to work in, a demo day, as is a showcase for investors. This comprises the set of things that these neuroscience entrepreneurs needed. And so, you know, we looked at these boot camps, and you know, these boot camps are not for doing push-ups, they're for rapidly iterating business models and creating successful, fledgling companies. And we had a bit of a realization. We said, instead of just importing the tools from the technology world, all the amazing software and electronics, why not also import some of the methods that have been so successful in Silicon Valley and elsewhere into neuroscience? And can we speed up neuroscience innovations in the same way? Well, this was a little bit of a crazy idea, but I was able to join with some incredible colleagues, and we've actually started the world's first neuroscience startup accelerator. It's called NeuroLaunch, and over the past year, we've helped 11 amazing startup companies become a reality and change the world by solving some of the toughest problems in neuroscience using startup methodology. All the things that I mentioned earlier, mentors, partners, workspace, peer network, demo day. Together with these entrepreneurs, we've created the most robust global network of neuroscience startup companies and innovators in the world. And it's extremely exhilarating to see what some of these people are doing. Let me take you for a moment into the future world that some of our companies have been working on creating. Imagine a world where powerful machine learning algorithms can be used to find new uses for old medicines to treat epilepsy and other disorders. How about a world where devices like this can be used to inject stem cells into damaged areas of the brain to repair it from the inside in a minimally invasive way without damaging surrounding tissue? Or, how about your doctor being able to access your brain MRI on the cloud from any device, manipulate it in three dimensions, and plan surgery or diagnose a disorder? Or for people like my grandma who are having a stroke,
the ability to unclog a blood vessel from the inside and use special technology to limit further injury. Perhaps most importantly of all, think of children with disabilities and creating a better future for them using friendly robots and neuroscience-inspired games to help them get stronger in physical therapy and rehabilitation. This is a sample of the brain-based future that I invite you to help us create. This is for all of us. Think of these incredible entrepreneurs in neuroscience working together to create a world where we can begin to understand the brain's inner workings, heal the brain and disease, and contemplate, maybe someday soon, beginning the daring and intrepid journey towards improving and augmenting the way all of our healthy brains interface with technology. Thank you.